This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 38, recorded on July 26th, 2012. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, how do you do? Very well. All the things in your part of the world. Very, very well. It's very warm here, though. Uh huh. And I'm sure it's 72 degrees and sunny out there. Right? Of course, that's all we ever know. Oh, always the same. <laughs> San Diego, that's in San Diego. Yeah. Also joining us today from my part of the country here on the East Coast from Yale University, Joe Handelsman. Well, hi. I'm looking forward to learning about our topics today. I don't know anything about pertussis. <laughs> well, the person who's going to lead us through pertussis is with us from the Medical University of South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. I, I think, Joe, the pertussis story will tie in nicely with uh, the second paper that we're going to do, of which you are an author, because um, uh, the interesting thing about pertussis is Bordetella pertussis is only infects humans. It's unique to us. And so that plays into the story. But I thought I would start today since the Olympics starts tomorrow and it will be in full swing by the time this goes up online. I thought I would bring to your attention an essay that appeared in the August issue of Nature Review's Microbiology. And it's appropriately entitled The Microbial Olympics. And it's, <laughs> it's brought to us by uh, Mary Yule. Uh, a friend to small things considered, and uh, I I view uh, M Mary and Elio as my muse in trying to make our science approachable, and oh, wow. uh, and I'm <laughs> specifically going to comment on this essay, which is um, a series of small little essays on various aspects of microbiology that is really quite elegant in how it describes microbes using this wonderful Olympic metaphor. And the essay that I thought I would start to help everyone put what we're going to talk about today is this massive pertussis outbreak in Washington state. Uh, over 3,000 cases since the first of the year, which is really pretty significant. And so I thought I'd introduce this concept by reading you the, the first paragraph of this essay, uh, which is written by uh, Steve Dingle, James Gurney, and Eric Pollack. And it really frames our question about why here, why now, and considering this epidemic of pertussis. So here we go. Staying in the, the NR microstadium, the next event is the pathogen relay. The conventional wisdom about virulence is that parasites inevitably evolve towards being benign in their hosts. Indeed, in 1875, it was written that a parasite makes a profession out of living as its neighbor's expense, and all its industry consists of exploiting it with economy without putting its life in danger, does not kill its chicken in order to have the eggs. More recently, however, it was shown that if recovery and virulence are linked, then intermediate virulence is favored, and it has been suggested that the mechanism of transmission also influences virulence. Thus, a biological trade-off has been proposed. In this trade-off, virulence is an unavoidable consequence of transmission, and if a parasite evolves a high transmission rate, there must be a cost in terms of the length of the infection, which can mean either recovery or death of the host. The pathogen relay differs from other events at our microbial Olympics in that it is the human hosts that line up at the starting line. Each is infected with a different pathogen, and it's these pathogens, each with a different transmission rate and level of virulence, 
that are the real Olympians. So now we move in to our story of today. So this is from Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. It's from the July 20th issue, and it's entitled The Pertussis Epidemic, Washington 2012. And it starts off by saying, since mid-2011, a substantial rise in Bordetella pertussis cases has been reported in the state of Washington. In response the, to this increase, the Washington State Secretary of Health declared a pertussis epidemic on April 3rd. 2012. By 16 June, the reported number of cases in Washington had reached 2520, and and uh, as of today, it's well over 3,000. Dr. Ann Shutt, who is the director of the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, said that doctors across the United States have reported more than 18,000 cases of pertussis so far this year. This is the first time since 1959 since we've seen so many so early. So if you're interested in, in figuring out if it's in your neighborhood, I found this great interactive map by the, that's hosted by the Council of, on Foreign Relations that the Bill Moyers group put out on the web. And it's, I asked Ray to put it into the show notes so you could uh, play, play with it to see whether or not pertussis or whooping cough uh, is in your neck of the woods. And it's, it's a classic heat map, and we're going to be seeing a different flavor of heat map in our, our second paper today. But um, this really um, puts it into perspective. Now, pertussis or bordetella pertussis is uh, this causative agent of whooping cough, which is produced as – you attempt to draw breath over your partially closed glottis, and it makes this classic noise, which sounds. And I'm going to try to do the the um, the inspirational sound when you go, <gasps> and you you make these noises, and it's a paroxysmal cough, which is sudden and almost uncontrollable, and. Um, you can also follow this coughing fit with vomit, and oftentimes uh, one goes with the other. And this problem uh, is especially manifested in small children, especially infants under one years of age, where uh, death can actually be the consequence. And hey, Mike, if- Michael, let me play this. Um, oh, you got the sound up? Yeah, you guys are not going to hear it for technical reasons, but our listeners will. Let me just give a couple of seconds of this. Yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty sad because you can tell it's a little child coughing and and gasping. Yeah, and in fact, between 1922 and 1948, pertussis was the leading cause of death due to infectious disease amongst American children under wow. the. Wow. No kidding. Now, vaccination has transformed all of this. Um, Between 1985 and 1988, there were fewer than 100 children who um, died from pertussis. And, you know, this is a a bacterial disease. This is a a gram-negative upper respiratory um, pathogen. Um, I presume it's transmitted by aerosols, right? It's transmitted by droplet secretion, our old friend from influenza. Okay. So fomites are, are a, a big thing to concern yourself with because you can actually uh, pick it up. The other interesting thing about this bug is that um, you don't actually develop this paroxysmal cough until about two weeks after being infected. And so you yeah. have... Excuse me, let me, let me correct one word. It's paroxysmal. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> I, I am one of these children that never had Latin, so... <laughs> I, I didn't either. I did. <laughs> you did? Did you have Latin, Joe? I had Latin, and I didn't like it very much. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The uh, CDC and the Washington State Health Department have been tracking this disease, and... 
and we're going to have a little digression here about uh, epidemiology. And um, this microbe is really hard to grow. It it really meets the definition of a fastidious uh, pathogen. Um, it's truly the Goldilocks microbe. Um, I, I talked to uh, my colleague who runs the clinical lab here to find out whether or not we have seen an uptick in pertussis in our local area, and we've been blessed, and we haven't seen an uptick. And she went into her rant uh, about how difficult this microbe is to grow and how important it is to obtain a nasal pharyngeal specimen in the proper manner. And the CDC has a tremendous resource on showing you how you actually obtain a nasal pharyngeal specimen and how you go horizontal to the floor and you push the probe into the nostril of the patient until you insert it literally to the length of the ear. So you look at the patient's ear and you insert that uh, swab so that it's almost to where wow. the ear and so you measure it. So you say to yourself, my God, they're really pushing that thing in. Then you pull it out and you uh, transport it uh, back to the lab in Reagan Low Auger, which is their preferred transport medium. And Auger is this really remarkable uh, transport system, and it's how pertussis grows. It consists of charcoal auger supplemented with uh, horse blood, and it's got to be defibrinated horse blood. You can't use the traditional sheep's blood. It also has starch in there, which neutralizes the fatty acids and peroxides, which are then toxic. Uh, my clinical colleague's name is, is Lisa Steed, and she said the plates have to be the right age. They have to be the right moisture. They have to be the right thickness, and you have to plant the organism on that plate just right in order for it to grow. It is truly the Goldilocks. Mm. If you're suspecting Legionella and you use buffered yeast uh, yeast extract charcoal agar uh, to grow Legionella, Bordetella can sometimes come up on it. So you have to be pretty good with your gram staining and observations because Bordetella can come out of a, um, a Legionella swab. Ilya, you had a question? Yeah, I had a question. It is, I seem to remember that in the, in the old days, maybe, uh, one way to uh, isolate uh, Bordetella prothosis was to have somebody who had a cough cough on an open agar plate <laughs> of the medium. And that, of course, would give you pretty much a pure culture because not much else is going to be um, in that amount in, in, in the aerosols. Is that still done? Would you know? I, I imagine it would still work because those old culture techniques still indeed work. But I think it's today about transport because today uh, most uh, primary care physicians don't have agar plates. Right, especially though not that specialized medium. The Reagan Low uh, agar is relatively new. The other thing the Reagan Low has in it, it has a cephalexin, which inhibits the, the growth of huh. Or from the, the nasal pharynx. Do we still use culture, Michael, or do we use PCR? Um, we use uh, culture and PCR, but PCR is the preferred methodology. And there again, the CDC has a caveat that you have to use the right type of swab. If you use the wrong type of swab, it's inhibitory wow. to PCR. So <laughs> this is a finesse microbe. To, to get out of the patient. So that's why the epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and the other wonderful public health departments across our country um, use the case definition. They use the case definition, which is um, an operational definition applied by a skilled clinician, which is a cough illness lasting at least two weeks with one of the following um, you either have to have this spurt of coughing, which are these short, frequent, uh, stereotypical symptoms. You have to have this in inspiratory whoop, or you could have the post uh, tussive vomiting, where you cough so hard that you actually um, 
then immediately vomit after that uh, without any other uh, apparent cause. Now, the coughing fits in the young adult and adults can last up to 10 weeks, and it's especially life-threatening in infants where they literally stop breathing. They become uh, apneic where they, they stop breathing. The good mm. news is, is antibiotics work. And uh, the better news is you don't – it used to be erythromycin was the drug of choice, but they have now found that um, 500 milligram single dose of uh, azithromycin on day one and then 250 milligrams on days two to five, you know, your classic z pack will actually work in adults and in infants and children, azithromycin um, also works as well. So you, you again, can, can treat it. It's also very important to treat before you develop the cough sim- symptoms. So if you do have this two weeks before you develop this 10 weeks of cough and you get antibiotics in that period of time and typically if your mucous membranes are inflamed or you just feel cruddy and you know there's some upper respiratory thing going on, uh, if they do, uh, if you are seen by your physician, they may end up prescribing you antibiotics and z packs generally are one of the things that they classically prescribe. That will actually lessen the severity and length of time that you're going to have this horrid cough. And, it, you know, no one wants to have 10 weeks of cough. Yeah. And, and Michael, uh, let, me, let me ask you one question. Isn't it the case that uh, the bug actually goes away pretty soon? And what the reason for the cough is the residual antigens that are left behind or toxins that are left behind by the bugs. But you don't isolate the bug after a certain period of of coughing. Is that right? A story analogous to that of uh, post-streptococcal sequelae. Yes, and so that's where I was getting into now the the God-fearing microbiology section of this is looking at the virulence factors associated with Bordetella pertussis. And first and foremost, there's no, this is not a zoonotic infection. This is an infection only of humans. So we are the only host so you can immediately appreciate vaccination will be so so, weak. so this is an eradicable disease then right yes the other thing to appreciate is that the virulence factors pertussis toxin it's it's our friend the a and b toxin where you have the dirty deed the a portion that does all the nasty stuff and then you have these b subunits that form this pentamer that facilitate the toxins entry. So, you know, it's it's the same type of toxin structure like our friend E. coli 0157's toxin, which is based on a shiga toxin. It's like the heat labile enterotoxins like from E. coli. It's similar to cholera toxin. It's the same design. Mother Nature figured out how to make nasty toxins and didn't vary on the theme. And it's really interesting. The pertussis toxin is released in an inactive state. And then what happens is it binds to the cell membranes, our cell membranes. It's taken up in an endosome, after which it undergoes this remarkable retrograde transport to the transgolgi apparatus and the ER. And at some point during transport, uh, a subunit or promoter becomes activated through uh, glutathione or ATP, and then voila, the pertussis toxin catalyzes the ADP ribosylation of the alpha subunits of the heterotri- heterotrimeric G proteins, which goes to Elio's point of you're now intoxicated. You're, you're, you're having this hangover of this toxin that's just hanging around and it's stuck. And the virulence factors associated with this microbe are the filamentous hemagglutinin, you have pertactin, you have fimbriae, and you have tracheal cytotoxin, all of which compound the pathology that um, you're seeing. And so we now understand how this, this creature is, is causing this, this nasty syndrome in us, and uh, which is 
the reason why we developed a vaccine for it because it was killing so many children and when we became ill it it really uh did a number on us so, so now the, the case fatality is less than one per thousand yeah that's because you can treat it right yeah and even in this outbreak even in this outbreak this epidemic in washington state there have been no deaths to the, uh, that i found on the cdc website uh, there may have been some sense this, because the CDC statistics lag a little bit, but uh, to date, there haven't been any deaths. Is there any concern about antibiotic resistance coming up? No, no concern about antibiotic resistance um, because very few people are treated for it. Mm, yeah. Mm -hmm. The vaccine is so good. The vaccine, but now what they're speculating and the why here, why now, speculating is what they're doing using is when I was vaccinated as a child, I was given a whole cell vaccine. Now, because of the reactogenic aspects of vaccines, what folks have done is begun to make acellular vaccines. And that's what's in this vaccine. This is uh, referred to as the DTAP vaccine. D stands for diphtheria, T for testness, and A, P is for acellular pertussis. And what they think is happening is that um, there's a, you, the, the vaccine strategy is uh, uh, DTAP routinely recommended at two, four, six, six months, uh, at 15 and 18 months, and at four and six years. So you get uh, a tremendous number of injections by the time you hit primary school. And it's recommended as a boost, a single dose for those 11 through 18. And as you age, what they're thinking, and they have a, uh, a chart, I think it's figure two in the MMWR report that shows where the infections are spiking and which age group. And I think the vaccine's efficacy is waning. And they also are wondering whether or not people are just not vaccinating their children to a sufficient level and extent. As I was doing my reading on this story, I came across this paper that was published in uh, 2009 in Emerging Infectious Diseases, and it was uh, published by a group out of the National Institutes for Public Health and Environment, Bilthoven, the Netherlands, and it's authored by uh, Fritz Moy, Inga von Lowe, uh, and a, a group of others. And what they are effectively postulating is that it's the regulation of the toxin production that is actually sel you're selecting for hydrotoxin producers. And it's a really elegant system because they're arguing that the reemergence of pertussis has been a multifactorial process, including um, the waning of the vaccine induced immunity because of the acellular vaccine, as well as as this um, a selection of uh, more potent pertussin strains containing a novel allele for the pertussin toxin promoter. Now, there are 14 genes in the pertussin toxin that are responsible for the development of, of the toxin. And their hmm. epidemiological data from this manuscript suggests that these strains are more virulent in humans and what they did is they did a classic uh, comparison. They went back to the freezer and began to look at the uh, pertussis toxin production. So this is basically a case where the vaccine isn't potent enough. It's not as good as the cellular vaccine, so you're getting waning immunity. I mean, this, this chart where they plot the age of the case versus whether they got acellular only or whole cell, it is really quite clear that the older kids who got the whole cell are fine. Yeah. It's amazing. So what are they going to do? We're not going back to the whole cell vaccine, right? No, we're not going back to a whole cell vaccine. Uh, they're trying to 
they're trying to understand um, the the group from the Netherlands is postulating the expansion of the uh, pertussis toxin promoter is actually increasing strain fitness in the humans. And so this mm. is how I made the tie into the the microbial Olympic story because this is a microbe for humans. And it's actually either adapting with us as we're moving it amongst the population, or it may just be uh, an issue that the pertussis toxin facilitates the enhancement of colonization in naive individuals. Mm-hmm. And um, and in fact, what they showed is that in their they were actually. They have a mouse model. They show that the pertussin toxin also enhances colonization in naive and immune mice by targeting macrophages and neutrophils and suppresses antibody responses. So this pertussis toxin is, is really an interesting uh, virulence factor because it is beginning to teach us a lot about uh, the immunology of what's going on. And I think this particular outbreak, because I, I'm certain that our friends at the CDC and the Public Health Department of Washington State are going to begin to look at uh, the toxin. They're going to begin to look at the genome of this microbe that are being pulled out of these patients to really try to understand if, if the pertussis that they're seeing in these individuals is sufficiently antigenically different mm. than the vaccine. Yeah. And, mm. and, or you can have the alternative because you can look at this and ask yourself the question, um, is this actually Bordetella peripatesis, which also can manifest similar symptoms. Um, but in general, the, this tends to be less severe and since we have not had any deaths, maybe because we have antibiotics now, or maybe because we've selected a different microbe, you know, I wonder if it's uh, paraprotestis because I don't know, and I haven't had time to go and ground truth the cross reactivity of the PCR to see if it will cross react with paraprotestis. Well, according to this, they say that um, of the 5,000 that they checked at Seattle Children's, uh, 175 were, 90 percent were B pertussis and and five percent were B parapertussis. So apparently the PCR can distinguish. Okay. Between the two, so it's that's not the issue that it's parapertussis, you know. Well, that is good, but so looking at all of these things, and there's also since Vincent's on with us, we always have to bring in a virus. Um, our current ASM president, uh, Jeff Miller. His labs investigates the trophism switching of the bacteriophage of Bordetella pertussis, uh, Bordetella pertussis phage 1, which um, this particular phage in, initiates in its, its infection by binding the cell surface receptor whose virulence factor is pertactin. And so they're actually – and. And the other peculiar thing about the biology of pertussis is that it's cyclical. It comes up and down every five years or so, and which is, again, reminiscent of a phage involvement. And so whether or not there's a phage involvement, and uh, Jeff's done some really elegant work looking at how uh, this particular phage actually engineers itself in order to adapt to the constantly changing uh, microbial receptor suite. And so I I think it's a very complicated story. I think it's more than parents just not vaccinating their children. Yeah, that's clearly. I mean, when I first heard about this, I thought that was it, right? Uh, Yeah. But it's, it's a very small percentage of these kids don't Uh, have not been immunized. Right. And so when you look at all of these things together, I think this is really um, a case where we have adapt or die ecology working because the human is the only game in town for this microbe. It can't jump to an animal unless there is an animal that we haven't just figured out that pertussis can jump to. But this is adapt or 
die ecology that we're seeing in real time because by virtue of the fact that we got smart enough to vaccinate to try to eradicate this microbe you know it's 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 trying to adapt or it's going to die off you know it could be that the the kind of subpar immunity provided by this acellular vaccine allows low low level circulation without serious symptoms and that is enhanced that's selecting for uh, the properties that we've been talking about. Mm. Um, and it's interesting. They don't offer any suggestions in this article about it, what to do, except keep, you know, try to increase immunization coverage. But it seems to me if the, if the vaccine is not lasting long enough, that something else has to be done. Right. Well, the, the cellular vaccine, the old vaccine seem to last longer. Yeah. And so maybe they should go back and reformulate the vaccine, maybe not using whole cells, but figuring out what it was in the old one, yeah. which prolonged yeah. immunity period. So, Michael, you said pretty emphatically that they wouldn't go back to the cellular one. Why is that? Uh, because it's so reactive. Mm. Uh, it's so reactive and the child becomes extremely fussy and um, it's it's part of that cocktail of diphtheria, tetanus and pertussis. And mm -hmm. I'm old enough to to have remembrance of, uh, you know, those horrible tetanus shots that had all four, three of those things in it. And it felt like someone beat you with a bat. Mm. And um, so I think that's why. And it yeah, most there, people there could be something in the cellular component, which which is which helps the prolongation of the immunity. Sure. Yes, sure, for sure. Maybe it's hard to find, but you know that it's worth looking for. It's probably uh, something that stimulates innate immunity, and that gives you a really good adaptive response. And right. Got to mm -hmm. figure out what that is and put it back in, or or maybe use an adjuvant or something that would really get you a better. Uh, adaptive response. Well, you know, I think that's what our friends in the flu industry are learning about the amount of antigen to give in a flu vaccine, and they're tinkering with lowering the concentration of antigen in flu vaccines by increasing the concentration of adjuvant. Mm -hmm. And I think if we take a page from our friends in flu of minimizing or maybe that's what's happened. Maybe our friends in flu have taught the vaccine makers to minimize the antigen and maximize the adjuvant, and maybe that's why it's not working. By the way, this um, this pathogen relay that you mentioned earlier, the winner was rhinovirus. Yes. The one with high transmission and low virulence. Mm. Yeah, I didn't want to spoil the SX for the <laughs> listeners. <laughs> It we is, should have uh, Ray put in a spoiler alert. A perfect pathogen. It's okay. There are other. There are many other races in this Olympics that they can. They can yeah, be on the edge of the seat. Perfect. It's, it's, Mary. Mary has this knack of of recruiting the the best and brightest and most clever to 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 write these stories, and um, the the there was just an, uh, a treat to read. Did you know this was coming, Elio? No, actually, there's, Mary and I work together very closely, and uh, yeah. uh, we're going to actually s separate a little bit because she has to give up some of her activities. No, but she didn't tell me about this. Hmm. This, is, this is very nice. Yeah. So uh, to close out the, the whooping cough, I'll just tell a little story. Um, in 1960, so my, my dad uh, came to the U.S. from Italy in 1940. 51, I think. And in 1960, well, by then he had two kids and a wife. So we went back to Italy to visit his parents. I was eight years old and I slept in a room with the, uh, the daughter of his, uh, his brother, my father's brother. And she had whooping cough. Mm. So all, all night long, she would have this whooping cough, which I'd never heard in my life. And he was an eight-year-old kid. And I said, Mom, what is wrong with her? And my father said, uh, it's whooping cough. And he said, you didn't get that because we vaccinated you. And, and they don't vaccinate very much. This is 1960, I guess. There wasn't much immunization. But every night, you know, we were there for a week. Every night, oh. this poor girl would do this whooping. And think about it. My parents, and my father was a physician, they didn't think twice about putting me in this room because mm. they totally trusted the vaccine. Wow. But who knows? You know, could have, might not have taken in me, you know, all kinds of problems. But I was fine. I never got it. But I'll never forget that cough. And this recording, which we'll link to, 
really brings back uh, <laughs> a memory of that time. Yeah, that was an awful sound. It was very disturbing when it's, you played that. It's disturbing, yeah. Mm-hmm. And in fact, um, the CDC on, the, on many of their information sheets right. caution that the vaccine may not actually protect you from disease. You may get some form of the disease, but it, what they say is it will be less severe. Yeah. Mm. So, you- so it's 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 a rather this this I think is a a really neat story and uh, it's really teaching us an awful lot about the ecology of microbes in humans. You bet. It's pretty rare to find a disease that's limited to humans, isn't it? And that yeah. and that with such a fastidious pathogen that doesn't live anyplace else, you almost wonder how it survived, don't you? Well, so that's a good segue to your paper, I think. <laughs> but I, Joe, I have worked on such a pathogen my whole career. Polio, Polio. is a yeah, exclusively human. Right. But you're right; there aren't a lot of them. Yeah, uh, measles. And- and aren't we pretty close to eradicating yes. polio? Yes, in so. fact, because there isn't another uh, host. And it's the same for measles, and that's the next uh, target, apparently, of uh, WHO to eradicate measles because, again, uh, it's exclusively human. In contrast, you can't eradicate flu because it's mm-hmm. in so many animals out there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Our next paper is in the journal Environmental Microbiology called Culturing Captures Members of the Soil Rare Biosphere, and it's from Joe's Laboratory. And uh, so this is a perfect time for you to tell us a little bit about what you're, you're doing, Joe. Okay. Thanks, Vincent. Well, this paper was one of those uh, somewhat serendipitous discoveries. We were studying the bacteria that live in soil in an apple orchard, asking questions about whether spraying the apple orchard with streptomycin changed the soil bacteria. And while we were looking at the the data, we just noticed um, this very, very striking result that we had analyzed both cultured organisms and culture independent uh, organisms that were, that were represented just by their DNA. And we found that there was essentially no overlap in the major groups that showed up by culturing and by molecular analysis. And interestingly, when we went back to the literature, you know, everyone had always said for the last, well, 25 years that the major groups in soil uh, weren't necessarily what we had thought they were based on um, on the culture-based analysis. Uh, but nobody had actually done the side-by-side, at least that we could, we could find, where they actually cultured from the same sample that they did direct molecular extraction from. And so that was kind of the first thing that was interesting was just that we couldn't find uh, very many other examples of this. And the side by side made it much more striking than the way people had made these arguments earlier, which was, uh, for example, there's a lot of Pseudomonas and Bacillus in the soil when you culture. And that is just historically um, been shown many, many times. But when you use a molecular uh, analysis and don't rely on culturing, uh, those organisms are actually not that abundant. And so we had sort of known this for a long time, um, but it was really a... a, a, um, a black and white, or I guess in in the paper we use green, it was a green and black, uh, very, very <laughs> distinct um, separation. And what we began to realize was that it's it's not just that the organisms that we see with the culture independent are new and different, because that's that's what people have been finding for the last couple of decades, is that when you do a culture-independent analysis, you begin to turn up these uh, organisms that we didn't know about before, with the classic one, I think, being the acidobacteria. Um, the acidobacteria are phyla, phylum that contains uh, a reasonable diversity of organisms, uh, but very, very few have been cultured. And what's amazing is that these seem to be the most abundant organisms in soil. So when people do a molecular analysis of soil, the acidobacteria are 
very often, but somewhere between 15 and 30 percent of uh, the sequences. And we know so little about it because um, the phylum is represented in culture by just um, a few a few isolates. So that's what people have focused on is all this new biodiversity that we see in uh, the culture independent analysis. But what we were realizing is that it goes the other way too, that in the culture analysis, we're picking up many organisms that are just simply not showing up in the culture independent. So that made us realize in a sort of backward way, we came at this through the back door, that this new concept of the rare biosphere, which has kind of taken hold in the last few years, uh, it's been uh, touted as sort of the next or perhaps last big frontier of microbiology, uh, is the concept of these organisms that are extremely low abundance, but still might have important functions in the environment. And there's been a lot of debate about it. There have been uh, some interests from uh, foundations and uh, certain, some funding agencies, federal funding agencies, and a number of scientists who have kind of touted this as um, a, a very potential very important part of microbiology that we sort of ignore um, because low abundance things that are in low abundance are of course very hard to pick up and and consequently hard to associate with function and so there's been this debate there was a the American Academy of Microbiology did a report that that really made a strong statement about um, the unknown quality of the rare biosphere and what we found was striking was that the rare biosphere may not be, at least components of it, may not be quite as unknown as people have been saying, because in fact, um, these very low abundance organisms are showing up in our cultures. Mm. And so it was kind of an ironic uh, result that after so many years of saying that culturing isn't really capturing the diversity or even important diversity uh, of environments like soil, um, we found that, in fact, this rare biosphere, these rare organisms are being cultured. That's the only thing that's being cultured in our <laughs> hands. But what was even more amazing is, of course, the rare biosphere is important. And this whole debate about whether it's important or whether it's not, as far as I'm concerned, in this soil sample was put to rest because uh, organisms that we know are critical, like rhizobia that fix nitrogen or certain groups of actinobacteria that produce antibiotics, uh, are among those in the rare biosphere. And so there's really no doubt based on 120 years of culturing microbiology that at least some of the organisms in the soil rare biosphere are pretty uh, pretty important to the ecology of the soil. So you did this in an, uh, in an apple orchard, but it could it could be done anywhere, is that correct? Yeah, and we've started looking at data sets from other environments, and it looks like there, there may be a very similar trend in at least most soils. We're about to do some uh, similar experiments in the ocean. We don't know about that yet. Mm. Uh, a couple of comments. First of all, our listeners should be aware that the term metagenomics was coined by none other than Joe, <laughs> and that she has played an immense role in the development of environmental microbiology seen through that technique. So it's something very satisfying that it is her her lab that comes up with this intelligence that cultivation is not out of the picture, on the contrary. So I think this is, it should be lauded for that. And it's, it's, it's this poetic justice in it. There's a certain symmetry in this that I find <laughs> pleasing. Now, um, the argument, as many listeners are aware of, is that a lot of people have said that metagenomics is a runaway technology that does not take into account the beauties of cultivation. And this is a justification of that argument in a way. I must, much of the argument has been fairly strident and I think a little bit over the, over the edge, but uh, this certainly uh, has been, um, it, there's every reason to bring sanity back into the picture and to say both things are important. Uh, after all, the, uh, in microbiology, we are used to the fact that a single bacterium can become umpteen million bacteria in no time at all. Mm -hmm. So the idea that the bacterium is present in small numbers shouldn't phase us. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. We know that one of the scenarios that is discussed in your paper is, in fact, that it could be seeds for blooms. And mm -hmm. that's one scenario. But this certainly something that every microbiologist uh, should keep in mind, that the numbers are a very difficult thing to um, to really gnaw at in microbiology. Small numbers can be just as important as big numbers. Mm -hmm. Well, when I was a, a graduate student, we... We used to teach this class to undergraduate micro majors that was based on, you know, the the work of Stanier and Van Neel, where you would literally design an enrichment. Mm -hmm. And and one of my classmates always made fun of me because I would ask the student, "Where do you get dirt?" <laughs> and you know, this was in Indiana, and you know. They think I'm. I grew up in Chicago, so a city boy doesn't know where you get dirt. But it's really a profound question when you're you're doing the classic in enrichment microbiology, where you're designing media to select out from a complex population that one unique species. And so, where do you get dirt? Is a really profound question <laughs> because it it really especially when now we have this beautiful metagenomic data. And I've been always intrigued by, by one of the terms that um, you introduce um, in this paper to the reader again, uh, talking about um, OTUs, which are these operational taxonomic units, especially in terms of, of, of the uncultured microbes. So I want to get it from if you will, straight from the horse's mouth, <laughs> as, asking, asking Joe, how do you think of them? Is a, an OTU an individual genus, a species, a strain? Since it's all based on 16S technology or 16S sequences, which because of what 16S does, you, you may miss the richness because I, I'm reminded, um, I, I did some work on um, uh, silage microbes, the microbes that ensile uh, whole plant uh, corn silage and wheat and other things. And, um, you know, the 16S, you know, there's so many different species of lactobacilli, but they all effectively have the same 16S genes, so you may actually miss them. So, you know, looking at your... The, to ensure a conservative estimate of richness, singleton OTUs were omitted. Mm -hmm. and, so, and, and that's what I, I think that's your most intriguing statement in this paper is that you, to be conservative, you omit something. And so that's why I want to understand what you think of an OTU is. Mm -hmm. So an operational taxonomic unit is. Uh, a group that shares a, a degree of sequence similarity. So the beauty of the, the, the phrase or the acronym is that you can set your stringency at any level and an OTU could approximate a strain, a group of strains, a species, a genus, family, you can go right up to phylum by setting the percent identity. And I think it was Norm Pace who proposed uh, about I think a little more than a decade ago, that we use a 97% cutoff for species. So if the members of an OTU differ by no more than 3%, then we consider them one species. And that may grossly underestimate the diversity. In some cases, maybe it overestimates, but probably underestimates. But it gives us at least a functional uh, way of grouping um, uh, similar organisms or the sequences that come from them and getting at least relative senses of uh, biodiversity. Um, it probably doesn't relate to a very biological concept of species, but interestingly, it does correlate with some of the classical taxonomy. Uh, not always, but some of the time. Um, so maybe at least in some groups of organisms, that degree of, of sequence similarity is associated with um, a, you know, a, a classical sense of what the, the taxon uh, was. So if we set the stringency much lower so that uh, organisms can differ by, say, as much as 5% of their 16S sequence, 
then we move to a, a genus, or if we move down to maybe 90% similarity, or they are allowed to have as much as 10% divergence, then we may be more at the uh, family level or beyond. And so the the lower cutoffs are a little bit hard to define. We don't really have a good sense of um, where a family ends and a phylum begins and those kinds of things, because in bacteria, taxonomy just is a lot more um, ambiguous, I think, biologically than in, in eukaryotes. Um, but at least at the high stringency, where we're asking that the 16S genes of the members of the group differ by no more than 3%, I think we do have a pretty consistent sense of the amount of biodiversity by that definition. And it's just a definition. It's not anything absolute. It's just a definition. And it is really interesting to compare the level of diversity when we use that kind of cutoff across soil versus ocean water uh, versus uh, in culturing versus uh, non-culture based uh, methods. And it it really does give us a very nice relative sense, but it's not an absolute. Does Terrific. that Terrific. Oh, it, it helps. It's, you know, having been tortured unmercifully by Norm for many years as a graduate student. <laughs> uh, That's right. You're Indiana. I forgot. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I, I got asked all sorts of interesting questions during qualifying exams, you know, at, at uh, OSHA. Ocean pressures, does the dielectric constant of water change sufficiently to alter protein synthesis? Things, aye, along, aye. Vo <laughs> things <laughs> along those lines. Norm, Norm was, uh, he had fun with graduate students. Tell us who, who, who you mean by Norm. Oh, Norm Pace. Uh, he's now at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And he, along with uh, Carl Woes, are probably the most early proponents of using RNA molecules from bacteria as the sentinel molecular chronometer. Mm -hmm. They first started with 5S RNA, and then they moved it up to 16S, 16S ribosomal RNA. And looking at the genetic sequence associated with that between Woes and Pace, they really... Um, set taxonomy on its ear back in the uh, early 80s. Right. Yep. Joe, if you do this with the gut microbiome or some other human microbiome, would you find the same thing? I'm not sure. The gut microbiome is much more culturable. So with soil, we estimate that only maybe 1% of the bacteria in the soil are readily culturable, whereas with the human microbiome, particularly the gut, about half of them are culturable. So that kind of sets mm -hmm. it at a different uh, level. Um, but my guess would be... Um, that at least some of what we culture from the gut or other human environments would be the rare ones. Yeah, and yeah. there are only a few examples that we know of those, but my guess is that there would be some, maybe not as many as in soil. Right. Elio, yeah. do you remember that paper we did where they were trying to culture microorganisms from the mouth, I think it was? With the little appliance. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah, well... Uh, Certainly, a lot of clever work has gone into trying to develop um, cu cultivation techniques which are out of the ordinary. And one of the big arguments, I think, is that so many bacteria probably grow as consortia that if you try to grow them as pure cultures, you lose. You know, you're not going to be able to do that because they can only grow in connection with other bugs. And so devices have been, uh, a lot of people have been working on this, trying to make devices which allow the growth of consortia or of growth of bacteria under conditions which more closely simulate yeah. the natural environment. And I think that's all to the good. And I think, uh, Joe, what, what, what's your take on that? Isn't this oh. a good thing that people try harder to cultivate? Yeah, and I think I, I think I know the paper you're referring to that was done by Kim Lewis and Slava That's Epstein. Right. 
Um, they, right. they did a really beautiful job of separating the bacteria physically, but allowing them to share metabolites that could flow f and diffuse exactly. freely between them. And I thought that was a really lovely way to approach it, since they have shown that particular metabolites can affect culturability, um, and the bacteria seem to share those metabolites. Um, so, yeah, I think we should be trying extremely hard to culture. Um, one example is going back to the acidobacteria that I mentioned before. When we first started finding them in 16S catalogs uh, from soil, we only had, uh, as I remember, one strain that was isolated um, in culture, and it, it was isolated from a very acidic sediment, and that's where those, the phylum got its name, acidobacteria. And it turns out that since then, uh, Peter Jensen from Australia has done some beautiful work culturing other species. And last I heard, he was up to 13 or 16, something like that. And the diversity, the physiological diversity, is quite dramatic, and they're not all acid-loving. And so the phylum got uh, its name uh -huh. before we knew very much about the group, and now we're kind of stuck with calling them uh, pseudobacteria, and th th that seems to be a very minor um, part of their physiology. But it, it is interesting to see the small changes in culturing techniques that have led to uh, success in Peter Jensen's hands and then some others. Um, uh, you know, it's th things as simple as leaving agar out of the medium or replacing it with gelatin. He found there were um, large groups of acidobacteria that that were happy to grow in culture if you just didn't feed them agar. <laughs> so, yeah, also, I you think know, uh, Joe Bresnak did a lot of work on that. He uh, he would add catalase, mm. which, uh, inhib which allows bugs to grow in the presence of oxygen radicals and things like that. So, mm -hmm. that, Yeah, that, it's kind how. of funny that the classic things that we have used as, as kind of our standards, things like agar or um, oxygen, have been the barriers for a yeah. lot of culturing in, in, the, in the gut bacteria, uh, just simply growing anaerobically vastly boosted the proportion that could be cultured and then you know auger so so i think we got into a few uh we got stuck in a few paradigms of culturing back in the late 19th century and we just kept doing it the same way and um changing those methods may make it very easy to isolate some of these organisms on the other hand uh Howard Guest, who lamentably passed away just recently, wrote profusely about the fact that there are old techniques for cultivation which have been forgotten and that people would do well to go back to some of the old literature. Obviously, like you say, some of the techniques or most of the techniques are not all that uh, they, they can be improved on, but there are techniques that we don't think about and which are buried in the literature. Yeah, yeah Howard, Dr. Guest had this tremendous technique called a gratostat which was um, a variation of a gradient plate, but it was in liquid culture. And he was able to, he pulled out some novel photosynthetic microbes. And um, it was, um, he did it along with, I think, Julian uh, Whitney. Um, and um, it, it was just a tremendous uh, technique of you have, uh, a gradient of various nutrients and, and the microbes will self-select to the right concentration of whatever the limiting nutrient is or the inhibiting nutrient is and then they would come up and you could literally uh, pull things out and he played games with uh, gases and allowing gases to diffuse and some of the old culture techniques that were pioneered in the 60s, 70s, and 80s before the advent of PCR really, I think, um, weren't going back and looking at, especially to the new microbiologists who have these tremendous metagenomic approaches that can go back and actually pull out their bug because now you have a signature that you can actually you know, demonstrate that you've got it. Joe, how did, how did you do the uh, the culturing? It says in the paper simply bacteria cultured from soil on medium. So this was not single colonies. These are mass cultures, I presume. Uh, no, they were single colonies, um, but we then turned them into mass culture. So there was some work back in the in the seventies that looked at a variety of different media and, and where you would uh, isolate the greatest diversity from soil. So we built on that and we found that this um, 
medium called uh, rhizosphere medium, um, which has the advantage that it inhibits uh, Bacillus mycoides, which is a bacterium that can cover an entire petri plate within a day or two, and it obliterates everything else on the plate because it's so aggressive. Uh, and so if you have mycoides... And beautiful, and beautiful. And beautiful, yes. <laughs> and it, it swirls in, in a beautiful um, spiral way and you can make mutants that spiral in the different direction mm. i've always wondered if you took it to the southern hemisphere if it would spiral the <laughs> other way <laughs> but it does get in the way of culturing other things because it grows so fast and it just grows across everything else so we needed a medium that would inhibit uh, bacillus mycoides because there was a lot in this particular soil and so we only used this one media uh, condition, the, the rhizosphere uh, medium, and we cultured under um, not very hot, not very cold conditions. Uh, and then we would uh, look at the isolated colonies, and sometimes we, we picked those and studied them, but most often we would just scrape everything on the plate and then freeze the mixture. And so it's a very crude method of getting an, the equivalent 16S analysis of the cultured organisms. We would then treat them just the way we treat um, DNA extracted from soil. We would extract from that whole mixture uh, of cultured organisms and look at the 16S uh, distribution among those. So it's, mm. it's not representative, you know, quantitatively, because, of course, how fast an organism grows on the Petri plate will dictate its representation in our mush, our mix, mm. uh, that would be not representative in the soil at all. But, of course, that's why we found um, that these were the rare biosphere organisms, because um, they were so infrequent in the soil and yet abundant on our Petri plates. Well, I, I consider this a hallmark paper. I think it'll be, uh, it's, it's what I call a paradigm shiftlet. It's not a, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it shifts the paradigm sum. Mm -hmm. so well, think, I'm glad you I, think so. And I sure hope that it brings a little bit more favor back to culturing because I'm tired of hearing reviewers say about my grants and other people's that it's useless to culture because we have metagenomics. In some ways, I feel like I, you know, I named a monster by um, creating uh, the name metagenomics. I certainly didn't mean it to um, replace the rest of microbiology, and that's unfortunately how some people treat it. Mm. Yeah, it's right. interesting. It's an interesting well, thing. Good what for you. Good what you, for you. What you really made. A big achievement. <laughs> what you made got away from you. Yes, or so it's been often. been used in an, in in an inappropriate way, in my opinion. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to read a couple of emails from our listeners. And the first one is Jim, who writes, As usual, I loved TWIM37. Joe Handelsman adds a lot, in my humble opinion. Oh, thank you, Jim. There you go. <laughs> is there, what better thing could could he say to keep you on the show more and more, right? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Flattery gets you everywhere. You bet. <laughs> and then he writes, I think Michael Schmidt meant dump data instead of data dump. Apologies to Alan Dove. I must admit, I don't understand that. I don't either. So you, you characterize the microbiome sessions at ASMGM as a data dump, remember? But I don't know why it would be a dump data. Maybe it's a computer thing. Yeah, I, I, I think it. Again, I, I think the it was so much information in in such a compressed format that um, you know you're still yeah I'm still decompressing it in my head, going through some of the things that we've heard. Yeah. Uh, looking forward to the upcoming bioinformatics guest. Thanks a million. Uh, Tim writes, Dear Twim Meisters. That's good. I like that. I'm quite behind in Twim, Twip, and Twiv because of my exams, which is a poor excuse, I know. Anyway, I just listened to Twim 22 with Dr. Sacchetti and thought I'd write in with my appreciation. As an RN student, I love it when your podcasts are specifically pertinent to my area of interest. In this case hospital-acquired infections, and the most common infections in emergency departments. This was one of the most fascinating episodes yet. I was wondering, though, if you'd consider doing something on infection control in a surgical setting. That is, if you had any papers on the effectiveness of surgical attire 
in preventing spread of infection to the patient and or protecting the surgical staff from the patient. Particularly, I'd be interested in hearing which microbes are most commonly found on the skin or in the hair of surgical staff. I wonder if surgical infections would be similar to those in emergency departments or if the percentages would be slightly different. Admittedly, such an episode would probably not be of interest to many, and the literature may not even be out there. My main purpose for this email was simply to express my appreciation for everything that you do. Keep it up. Much respect to every one of you from Tim, who is in Melbourne, Australia. Oh. My goodness. Wow. That's it. I think Tim has a really good idea. We should maybe do a set of papers that talk about hospital microbiology in general. Um, one of the, the results I heard last year was that you can cut hospital infections by about half simply by instituting really rigorous hand washing. And I didn't realize that it was that dramatic. So those might be worthwhile papers to read. And, and I think our listeners would be interested. I bet Michael could probably recommend some, right? Oh yeah, there, there's been there's been whole conferences on on hand hygiene, and I think there's some really interesting microbiology and even some ecology that can come out of um, the hand hygiene studies because of the use of alcohol. And um, I took a picture of one of our alcohol. Uh, dispensers as I was sitting in chairs waiting to have my blood drawn at the doctor's office and it had this beautiful green biofilm growing at the yeah. interface uh. of where the alcohol concentration was just at the just at the right level for the pseudomonas to actually eat it <laughs> rather than be killed by it. What concentration oh would that be? I, I don't know. I, I haven't done the experiment to find out, but <laughs> the concentration that that is in alcohol hand gels is 66%, which for those of you drinking liquor, that's 120 plus proof. So it's, it's pretty strong uh, alcohol, but they also add emollients and all sorts of other things to the alcohol. So don't go out drinking the alcohol and hand sanitizer. <laughs> Well, I think it's a good idea, Tim, so we'll we'll get working on that. And our last one is from Alicia, who writes, I, I was listening to TWIM a few weeks back, and if I remember correctly, it was mentioned that it would be interesting to find someone that could discuss spirochetes with you. I would like to recommend one of my professors, Dr. Caroline Cameron. She is Canada's research chair in molecular pathogenesis and teaches at the University of Victoria. I have spoken with her, and if you have any future papers concerning spirochetes, especially Treponema pallidum, subspecies pallidum, or Leptospira, she would be interested in participating. I hope you do an episode. Any of you know Dr. Cameron? No. No, no we, I can't say I do, but I think the topic is fascinating. Yeah. We should have a field trip to the University of Victoria. Hey, all right. Hey. Okay. <laughs> where is that? I don't know where it is. I think it's on Victoria Island uh, off of Vancouver. Nice. I, I think that's where Vancouver it is. Island. Island. Vancouver yeah, Island. Yeah, Vancouver Island. I do like it out there. All right, that will do it for TWIM number 38. And, of course, you can find TWIM on iTunes or at microbeworld.org slash TWIM. If you are new to iTunes, do subscribe to the podcast there. And that way you get every episode automatically and do rate it as well. It helps us to helps to keep us visible on the iTunes podcast page so that more people will find us. If you would like to ask us a question or make a comment, you can do that by sending an email to twim at twiv.tv. Elio Schechter is at the wonderful blog Small Things Considered. Thank you. Elio. Oh, my pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Nice, nice session. Yep. Joe Handelsman is at Yale University. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. I had a great time. By the way, I spent five days in Madison this week. Oh, lucky you. What were you doing there? Uh, the American Society for Virology Conference. Ah. Which is yeah. at that wonderful Monona Terrace Convention Center. I don't know if you've ever been there. Oh, of course. The Frank Lloyd Wright design. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. it's great. Great view, great facility. 
And was the virology meeting good? Oh, it was fabulous. Ah, it was fabulous. Good. So over on my other podcast, TWIV, you know, we've been talking about going to ASV. And we got an email from a high school student who listens to us. And she's from Madison. Mm. And she told us that she listens to, she listened to TWIV uh, while she, she sewed her prom dress. <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, when you come to Madison, make sure you eat Che- curdled cheese is that what it's called cheese curds cheese curds. Cheese curds okay i'd never heard of this mm. so uh yesterday after the meeting was over i walked out into the that street right before the Capitol, and they had a, a farmer's market mm-hmm. and a guy a farmer was there with his cheese curds so i tried one and it does make it does squeak when you chew it yep they are squeaky <laughs> you can also get them deep fried vincent i heard that but they don't squeak when you deep fry them right <laughs> right, they just clog your arteries more quickly. <laughs> yeah, but I had to get the squeaking feeling, so I did it. And I was surprised that they were yellow. I thought they'd be white. Mm. Anyway, uh, I Michael Schmidt is at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Thanks for giving us the rundown on Bordetella. Ah, uh, good old pertussis. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at my blog, which is at virology.ws. Many thanks to ASM for supporting TWIM, Communications Director Barbara Hyde and Chris Condayan and Ray Ortega for their technical help. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.